Ephesians chapter 3 is where we're headed. You know, um, last week it was great. Uh, I want to say 2006, 2007, somewhere in there, there, uh, there was a great, uh, there were several families in our church that was just in that season um, of their life and even of our church life. And God laid it on John Utley's heart um, to start a church in Elkhart. John had been in ministry for years. And God put it on his heart to start another church on the north side of Elkhart, Granger area, somewhere in that area, whatever. And so back in the day, many of you weren't even here, um, but we just, we gave our complete blessing and about 15 or 20 people from our church went with them and they started that church. And it was, it, I, I remember even being on the front end of that in the talks with John, even before he, it was public, before it was announced, and, and just the dream and the thought and being in on all that. And so last Sunday, for the first time ever, I was able to worship with them. So thank you for loaning me out last Sunday. But last Sunday, I was actually there at their church, and I, I preached, I shared. John, their pastor's on sabbatical, so he asked me if I'd come in and just share for a week. And it was just really, really cool. Some of those faces I remember from being a part of our church. Um, uh, others I, had never, I didn't know from Adam or Eve. But, I mean, and that's good, right? I mean, it was great. That uh, to see it come full circle, so I appreciate that. But the message that I shared, I, I just couldn't get away from it. The message I shared with them was Ephesians chapter one, and and you don't have to necessarily turn there, but in Ephesians chapter one, remember it was the the longest run on sentence in the New Testament, maybe even the whole Bible. I don't know, but verse uh, chapter one, verse uh, three through fourteen is just one long run on sentence. The Apostle Paul writing the letter to the Ephesians. And he's like, hey, before we get any further, I just got to praise God. Do you understand what an amazing salvation we have? And as I start my message here today, can I just encourage you with something? What an amazing salvation you and I have. Amen? I mean, uh, the, the Apostle Paul uses words like this. Uh, God has chosen you. He has adopted you. I mean, just grasp that, get that. He has redeemed you, and because he's redeemed you, he's forgiven you, and he's given you great wisdom and knowledge. And not only that, but because he's redeemed you, he's guaranteed. Do you realize that our salvation is guaranteed? <laughs> Your salvation, my salvation is guaranteed. The moment you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit came into your heart, came into your life, and, and you're guaranteed an inheritance. These are all words that the Apostle Paul uses in the first 14 verses of Ephesians chapter 1. He's like, this is amazing, this is great. And then he busts in a pretty powerful prayer and talks about the, the power, Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. And then he gets into chapter 2 and he even talks about how we are seated with Christ. We are seated with him. That's the authority we have. All that Jesus Christ has, the power and the authority is now we're seated there with him. I mean, how powerful is that? Just get that. And then in chapter 2, there's two but gods. I'm so glad for the big butts of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, where, where it says, this is, this is what you were like. Uh, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he came and he saved us out of all that. So when it comes to our salvation, we're now saved. We're now set free. That's what we were. We were sinners. We were lost in our sin, dead in our sin, but now we've been made alive in Christ. The Apostle Paul saying this and rejoicing in this. And then a few verses later, he talks about in, in uh, verse um, 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Do you remember that message where I talked about the unity how, how um, the Jews and, and the Gentiles used to be like, uh-uh, don't want anything to do with each other. And the Apostle Paul was saying, no, listen, now we've been brought together, all of us, through the blood of Christ. You were separated before, but God stepped in through his son Jesus. And he, on the cross and the resurrection, he brought us all together. And we're one. We are family. I mean, it's not biblical, but it's, it's a song. But... But that's what he's saying. We're one. And then when we get into Ephesians chapter 3, 
Now, I, I sent Matt and Jason on ahead. I was looking at all these passages, and it wasn't that I didn't think any of them could share this message well. I just thought this is probably the hardest of all the messages. So, so I, I, Jason went ahead and preached the prayer. If you, if you missed the prayer two weeks ago, the, I think starting in verse 14 of uh, chapter 3. And then Matt actually got us into chapter 4. But today I want to jump all the way back to verse 1 in chapter 3. And I want us to look at this. I, I, it it kind of cracks me up because I think all of us have been there, done that. Um, but let's just look. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 3. For this reason... For what reason? For this reason. What reason? Because you were chosen. Because you were adopted. Because you were redeemed. Because you were forgiven. Because you have great knowledge through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. Because of, of your inheritance that you have. Because the Holy Spirit's in you. Because this is what you were dead in sins, but now you're alive. Because now we're all one together. For this reason, for this reason, that's the reason, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. Wait, 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 wait. I mean, just look at that. Let's read that verse one again. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Come on. Paul's getting ready to pray a powerful prayer. For this reason, I pray for you. In fact, you go to verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom this whole family in heaven and earth derives his name. And so Paul's getting ready to pray. He says, for this reason, I, this is going to be, and I'm going to pray for this reason. But all of a sudden, er, it's like, have you ever seen the movie Up? Squirrel. I think the Apostle Paul had a squirrel moment. I mean, study it. Look at it. He's getting ready to pray for this. I mean, what, what if Bob would have got up here a few moments ago and he would have said, let's pray. Said, By the way, can I tell you about the latest feeds for most cows and dogs and other animals? And he deals in some of that stuff. Um, uh, it, the Apostle Paul was like, for this reason, I'm going to pray. That's why I'm praying for you. But Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you that it's a mystery made known to me by revelations I have already written. written. And he goes on and he starts talking. So I want to ask this question. Why, why did he get off here? Why, why did the squirrel moment happen? I mean, what was it? Why did, why did Paul digress? Have you ever been sidetracked by something? I think we all have at one point or another. What was the Apostle Paul's issue here? Well, let's just look at that. And I, I, I think there are two main thoughts that I'd like to pull out of these next few verses. And I'd like to grab a pen or whatever, fill in your notes. This first one is, this is it. He starts talking about his credentials. His credentials. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many of you have ever been in jail or prisoned? <laughs> Again, I'm not asking for a show of hands or even to point fingers. But do you know the Apostle Paul, it looks like probably spent somewhere around five years of his life in jail or in prison. Um, on two occasions, uh, there's a couple years in Caesarea, and there are three years in Rome. Now, when he's in Rome, it was more like a house arrest, and that's where we see him today as he's starting to, uh, um, to share this, this letter to the Ephesians. Now, I want you to notice something, though. He's not saying I'm a prisoner of the Jews. He's not saying I'm a prisoner of you. I, notice who he's a prisoner of. Look at verse 1 again. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Is that significant? Did Jesus put him in prison? No. It was the Romans. It was the Jews. Right? Do you remember as, as we're, we, uh, a couple weeks ago, I had this, uh, this picture of the, um, um, of the temple. And there were certain courts and certain areas that Greeks, or excuse me, Gentiles were not allowed to go past this area. Do you remember that outer? Greeks couldn't, or Gentiles couldn't go past that. And so most, most scholars believe that the Apostle Paul was thrown wrongly into prison, into jail, because they said that the Apostle Paul invited these Gentiles to go past those areas in, inside, and in, in, in essence, he was giving Gentiles a position that they didn't deserve in that Jewish temple. And so he was serving. So it would have been correct to say, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Jews, 
the prisoner of the Romans. But no, he says this. He says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's not trying to guilt them in any way. There was no gloom, despair, and agony on me. Oh. Come on, have you ever watched Hee Haw? I grew up on Hee Haw. Come on, any Hee Haw fans? Oh. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, thank you. Um, uh, some of you have no idea what we were just talking about. You need a YouTube Hee Haw, and you'll just gloom, despair, and agony on me. I remember it would come on, it seemed like, like right around 5 o'clock, and we had church. Sunday nights, Sunday nights, every Sunday night we went to church. And, and if dad got to watching Hee Haw, I knew there was a slight chance we could skip church. <laughs> As a future pastor, I don't know why that so excited me, but um, okay. The Apostle Paul wasn't sitting there saying, Whoa, is me. Although it would have been fine if he would have, and I'm sure there probably was moments maybe when he was there where he says, Listen, I'm not going to throw this out. I, I'm just saying, the Jews are in charge of me. The Gentiles, uh, the, 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 the uh, Greeks, the, the Romans, they're not the ones who has control of my life. The one who has control of my life is Jesus Christ. I've submitted my life to him. And, and Jesus, I, if I'm here in prison, I'm following you, and it's because Jesus has put me here. I was just thinking about that. There was this psychotherapist. I, I, I was, as I was studying this week, I saw this Viktor Frankl. He maintained that people can endure any what as long as they have a why. People can endure any what as long as they have a why. This guy spoke with credibility. He had actually survived the Holocaust. And that was the context of that quote, that conversation. Where he's like, I knew the why, and so the what was bearable. And I think this is exactly what we see in the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, though he's in prison, though he's in, in, uh, in, in, in chains, he knew why he was walking through that. In fact, I, I want you to see exactly what the Apostle Paul went through. Um, if, you, if you can, turn your, a couple pages before Ephesians to 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It will also be on the screen. But 2 Corinthians chapter 11 because the Apostle Paul lays out his pedigree, if you will, of exactly what this guy went through. And we're going to relax and we're going to take time and we're going to read these verses because I want you to get this. Remember, this is the Apostle Paul writing in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote much of the New Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit. He, wrote, uh, uh, he accomplished great things for God. And so you think his, his life was a, a, a box of chocolates, as they say. Not so. Look at verse 22, leading in at verse 21. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. What anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Get this. Five times, this is the Apostle Paul, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's 39 if you need help with the math. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and I've been naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast. I'll boast of the things that shows my weaknesses. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying. 
In Damascus, the governor and the king, Aratus, had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. The whole city was guarded. Soon as Paul shows up, arrest the guy. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Does that not sound like the latest Jason Bourne movie? <laughs> On steroids? I'm, as you are studying the New Testament, as you're studying the book of Ephesians, as you're studying much of the New Testament that was written by the apostles, remember the experience. That this isn't just some fly-by-night guy who just drove in and, hey, follow me. No, this is an apostle. This is someone who God put his hands on and called, and his credentialing alone was in, in the call of God. He says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. How could Paul persevere in the face of such suffering? It's because he had a why for the what. Paul knew that his life was in God's hands and that nothing had come into his life that had not first passed through the nail-scarred hands. Do you have this confidence? Do I have this confidence? Let me just remind you, you've heard me use this illustration before, but if this circle right here is my life, and as I am submitted to Christ, not necessarily perfect, but my heart, is surrender to Christ, say, Lord, your will be done. I'm praying. It doesn't matter what happens in people's lives around me, who does what. Jesus Christ is at the helm of my life. I must be at a point where I can step out and just look in and say, okay, God, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. I'm really enjoying that. That's good. Those people annoy me. Why are they in my life? Ugh. But those people are great, and I can have all these thoughts about the situation in my life. But ultimately, what I have to say is, God, all of that, I trust you, and I believe you're working it all for my good. As a follower of Christ, the moment you knelt the knee, if you will, you gave your life to Christ, you said, come good, come bad, come tragedy, come triumph. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. I trust that you're in this. I trust you're in the middle of this. And that's the secret that the Apostle Paul learned. He said, I'm in prison. God can use that. I'm hungry. God can use that. I'm in a state of, I just don't have a lot. God can use that. I'm in a state of plenty. God can use that. It doesn't matter where or what that we could have the attitude that wherever I'm at, God, you're in this. There's nothing that can happen to me that hasn't, hap that hasn't crossed the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. And Jesus had said, I'll allow that. That's a tough spot to live in. That's a tough spot to be in. Because you look at all the suffering and the injustices around the world, and you're like, really, God? Why are you allowing that to happen? That's a whole other message. But for you and I, we have to come to the point where we say, God, I trust you. I put my faith in you. I don't know if I'd have the best of perspectives if I was sitting in jail. I'm not sure I'd have that same perspective if I were in the Apostle Paul's shoes. This is why the digression. This is why the squirrel popped up here. This is, he, he forgot to start praying because he got, got off track just saying, listen, this is, this is what I know. I, I, do you guys, we better go back to Ephesians. Jump back there. Um, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me. That is the mystery made known. To, and he starts going, you guys understand this, this is a God thing here. God knows who you are. He didn't forget your name. And wherever you are today, let me just tell you, no matter the situation, he can use you. He can flow through you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 says this. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Again, the Apostle Paul speaking. has served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become very clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 
Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more create courageously and fearlessly. The apostle Paul is saying, God's using this. I know you wish that I was out of these chains. I know you wish that I was past this trial. I know you wish you love me. It hurts you to see me go through this. I know that. But I want to tell you something. God's using these chains. God's using these trials. There's others whose faith is being encouraged and they're beginning to speak up and have boldness like they've never had before. Paul saying, yeah, I'm in prison, but God, to you be the glory. Yeah, I'm in prison, but God's using me. He's saying, you can chain me up, but you can't chain up the gospel, and you can't chain up the power of my God. So here's my question to you. What do you feel chained to? What do you feel chained to? Because you can be all chained up, but you can join Paul in saying, yet to God be the glory, and he'll use you right where you're at. It's got to feel like I'm chained to my past. Hey, your past is your past. I can tell you, Jesus can step and even use your past for his glory. I feel like I'm chained in a relationship. God can take that and use you even in the midst of it. Notice, the Apostle Paul isn't saying, oh, just wait until I get out of these chains. Boy, (laughs) wait till I get out of these chains and get out of this. Then we're really going to do some ministry, let me tell you. We're going to start a television ministry. We're going to go door to door. I mean, we're just going to start a feeding ministry. And we're going to just, I mean, the Apostle Paul, he was like, just wait till I get out of these chains. No, 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 no. He's saying, God's using these chains. And the moment you and I can begin to look at the chains that, for whatever reason, are are in our life, and it's just where we see it, the the, the, the heart, what, what you had dreamt for your children, and it's not quite turning out, your dream, what you had dreamt about your marriage. It's like, God, I just I envisioned one day that this, and it's just, it, it's not happening. The career, the job, the future, the past, whatever. You just feel like, I can't get away from this. And you want to run. But what God's saying is, I put you there. I'm with you there. I can use you in your chains. I'm not saying don't pray, oh God, get me out of here. (laughs) I pray those prayers all the time. But I've added this prayer. God, if you're trying to teach me something here, if there's something you're trying to work through, then God, keep going. I yield to you, Lord. He shares this. He's laying out his credentials. I'm here as a prisoner of Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. That's, I'm here, because I, I know physically it's the Jews that put me here, but I'm no prisoner of the Jews. I won't give them that one. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. There's not one thing that can happen to me that Jesus hasn't already signed off. That's my credential. And the second thing, fill this in your notes, is his calling. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. This call. I'm a steward of God's grace. I'm an administrator. I'm a manager. God gave this to me, and this is very important. Same for you. God's grace on your life is for you. Some of you, you see God's grace, and, and maybe even this morning, as you're like seeing these musicians, you're like, man, I wish I could pick and like that. I, I wish I could play, like, I wish I could sing. Like, no, 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 stop being jealous of anyone else's gift and just use your gift. Find your gifts, your God-given abilities, and, and, and that's the grace that God has given you. You know, there, there, are, there are things that God has graced me with, and there are things that absolutely God has not graced me with. The older I get, the more I understand those that he has not. <laughs> and I try to just stay away. <laughs> and it's, it's wise. <laughs> but listen, God has graced you. He's given you grace in certain areas of life. And, and, and let's come to grips with where that grace is and let's flow in that. And the Apostle Paul is saying, God has graced me with the call and the, the, the direction to lead you people. 
He says, I surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. God has you there wherever there is. He's called you. You're to be a steward of what he's called you to do right where you are. It's not all about you. It's about those around you that God has brought into your life. They need to learn from you as you do life and community together. They need to see how you made it. Listen to me. Your faith journey is not all about you. Your faith journey is not all about you. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. You see, what the body of Christ needs to see is they need to see how you made it. They need to see how you fought the good fight for your kids. They need to see, no matter what happened in your marriage, they need to see that you stayed faithful to Jesus. They need to see that you, you walked the high road. They need to see, as, as the diagnosis came, there's others in this church that need to see and say, if she made it, if he made it, then so can I. Your faith journey is more than just about you. We're a body. And the Apostle Paul saying, I want to use my gifts. My call is to love you. And my call is to minister to you. For you indicates that God had given Paul this special stewardship for the sake of others, not just for the apostle Paul. You see, God had assigned Paul the special work of preaching the good news to the Gentiles, bringing the gospel message to them. Have you ever considered the fact that everything God gives us as abilities, Spiritual gifts and opportunities for ministry are for the sake of others. Think about it. If salvation was just about you going to heaven, as soon as you gave your life to Christ, why didn't he take you home? Why not? Because he still has a work for you here in this body of believers. Do you get that? Your faith journey is not just about you. It's about others. Pastor Kirk Cook, I was listening to his message this week on the subject. And he said this, when God starts to do something in you, he starts to do something through you. <laughs> Come on, think about that. Whatever God's doing in you, it's not just about you. It's because he wants to do something through you. Minister through you. And Paul recognized this. And he said, I I'm only a steward of this. Now let's just relax. I know uh, we're, we're almost done here, but verse, verse 4 Let's just read this. In, in reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight in the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. Verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in a promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His w intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. According to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Verse 3. God gave me a divine revelation of this mystery that was hidden for ages. That's God's plan for salvation, his plan for blessing them. This included the Jews and the Gentiles. So the Apostle Paul saying, this gospel message, God showed me. This isn't just for the Jews. This is for the Gentiles. It's for all of us. In verse 6, this was almost inconceivable for both the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul says, God's given me this ministry to share this mystery that rather than the two, you are one in Christ. 
It's what we saw at the last part of chapter 2 in verse 13 where it said this, But now in Christ Jesus you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. 19. Consequently you are no longer foreigners but fellow citizens with God's people. Member of God's own household. Look, Look in your notes. Fill this in. Three terms used in verse 6 here. The first term is heirs. Heirs. It's not really a, <clears throat> something we use often today. Let's see. Oh. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to steal your water. <clears throat> um, it's not something we use, but we're heirs. We're heirs. Look at this. We're heirs together. Jews and Gentiles are adopted into the same family. Now, this, this, is, this is, in a sense, it's, it's unheard of. It's almost like a Bears and a Packers fan. I mean, they don't mix, right? I, I mean, a Jew and a Gentile, as some of you, you don't understand, Bears and Packers don't like each other, all right? Uh, uh, let's do it this way. Notre Dame and Michigan, okay? Is that any better there? I mean, they just, no, no, no. Jew and Gentile, uh-uh. They don't want, but God's saying through Christ, we're now one. We are heirs. The other next word is it's members together. As members of one body, they're united into one under Christ, the head. The third word he uses is sharers. As sharers in this promise, they'll be fellow partakers, co-partners, and receiving the blessing of God. Up until this point, the Jews were like, we are the chosen. Up until this point, the Jews are like, we're the best. We're God's people. Look at us. I mean, it's me. It's us. We're. But Paul's saying not so anymore. He's saying the, the mystery is this. You didn't see this in the Old Testament, but God has shown it to me. And the Apostle Paul's saying, and all the modern day apostles and prophets, he's revealed this to us. He's bringing us together under Christ, making us one, mystery solved. And, and, and what's the purpose of all this oneness? Look at verse 10. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. He, he wants his wisdom to be made known. Uh, a great man of God, uh, Matthew Henry, said it this way. He said, when we take God for our God, we take his people for our people. He wants his wisdom to be made known. He wants his, this mystery to be made known that we are no longer Jews and Gentiles. We are one body. And this is the thing. You, even other believers in other churches, if they call the name of Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, we're one. Everyone in this, you, you can't, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to say it again. You, you can't say, well, I love Jesus. I just can't stand his church. <laughs> Again, that's like saying, I love Scott, but I can't stand Megan. Woo. You, would you ever say that? You better not. Because <laughs> if you do, we'll have issues, right? Am I right? But here's the deal. When we take God for our God and Jesus for our Jesus, we take his people for our people. And we're one. And that's the heart. That's the mystery is that the Gentiles, this is for you. This salvation is for you and for Jews and for all of us. You look around, and, 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 and all of this was for God's glory. You look at all the people here. You look at this great facility. You look at all that God's done through this church over the past 15, this December 16 years. This is all for his glory. And God's like, I want this to be known. I want this million. In fact, verse 12, look at this. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. He's just reminding us, just before I get into this prayer, remember? It was like, uh, and, and for this reason, I, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, shall we pray. Now, did I tell you about the grace that's been given to me? And he's, he's just, he's kind of finishing up. Before he gets in that prayer, as he's still on the rabbit trail, he says, let me remind you, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Let's remember, we can go boldly. We have access through Jesus. And then verse 13, he says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. He says, I just want to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you. I know the why I understand the why. And can I just throw this in there? I think this is the hardest thing for most of us. Because you're like, Scott, I'm there with you. If I can understand the why, okay. What if I can't understand the why? 
Well, then you just gotta go another step up and say, ultimately, why am I here? Am I here for my happiness? You see, God didn't, I know it sounds harsh, but God didn't create you to be happy. He created you to have joy. And we can have joy in the midst of sorrow, right? We can have joy in the midst of tribulation. We can have joy in the midst of all kinds of baloney. He wants you to have joy. He wants, you to, he wants me to learn how to have joy in the midst of, 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 of whatever. But if you and I can come to the point of saying, I'm not here to make myself happy. I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to bring glory to him. And if me walking through this trial, oh, I don't want to struggle. But if me walking through this somehow brings glory to him, I'll go there, God. If me walking through this, the Apostle Paul was like, hey, I know the why. I know I've been called. I know my credentials. I, I, I know my calling. I know why I'm doing this. It's so that Jesus Christ can be glorified and that others can be strengthened. And so I'm okay with it. As, as we think about this, why did Paul go off in this other direction before the prayer? And he goes, verse 14, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power. And he begins to pray this powerful prayer. Jason already talked through that. But even before he got there, he's like, I got to nail some things down here. We got to talk through a few things. The point was this. He wanted the Ephesians to know clearly this, this new church. He said, I want you to understand you are, you are part of God's master plan. You're not an afterthought. In fact, as you look at uh, verse 11, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished, there was an eternal purpose. This was the way God was going the whole time. This wasn't an afterthought. Do you know in Genesis chapter 12, do you remember uh, Father's Day, I shared the message about Abraham? Father Abraham. And, and God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless those that bless you. Curse them. And that blessing is for all of us. It wasn't just for Jews. It was for all of God's people. That's you. That's me. And we're all made one through Christ. As Paul's getting ready to pray a beautiful prayer for the church, he wants them to know that God loves you so much that you have been included in this plan. I don't know if there was confusion in Ephesus. Maybe there was some false teaching. Maybe they were struggling with this idea. But the apostle said, Paul said, we've got to nail this down. You are one in Christ. You are one in Christ. Jew, Gentile, we are one in Christ. And we, when, he, when Jesus set out to do the work on the cross and all that that entailed, when Jesus did that, it was for the Jew and the Gentile. It was for every person here. Black, white, Hispanic, Chinese, German, Saudi Arabian. Doesn't matter. We're all uh, 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 people that God sent his one and only son to die on the cross for you. Do you get that today? Worship team, would you come quickly if you could? Some of you have maybe come from a family that didn't necessarily follow God. Here's the good news. God knows you. He knows your name. He loves you so much and is, is, is ready to forgive you and give you life right now. The past, your family, whatever. It, he's, just, he's concerned about you right now. Are you walking in his grace? I, as, as we conclude this morning, I just want you to begin to think about that. Because I believe there's there's... In a sense, there's two kinds of biblical grace. There's the grace that, to save you, and there's the grace to live. What do you mean, Scott? There's the grace that we sing about, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I mean, it's his grace where he's like, I freely give you salvation. It's, it's not because of how good you are or how good I am. He's like, here. And we put our faith in him and receive salvation by his grace. But then, you know, the Bible talks about like here where God gave the Apostle Paul a special grace to share this mystery of the gospel with the Gentiles. He was graced. He was, so we might call it like a sweet spot. It, it, it was, uh, I've been watching some Wimbledon. You've been watching any Wimbledon? I haven't watched tennis for years. But I know enough from my tennis years. <clears throat> I played one year in high school. That was about it. But that there is a spot on that tennis racket that's kind of the sweet spot. On, on that tennis rack. If you can hit the ball there, you can really command that ball and tell it where to go. 
And you know, every one of us, we have grace that God gives us to, to be in that sweet spot. And some of you, you let's face it, I, I, there are certain things, I, I'll probably never be a seamstress. <clears throat> Does that surprise you? I'm not so sure I've been graced, but there have been a few times where I've, you know, I remember one time specifically back in college, I sewed up a hole in a sock. I was like, why I didn't just go to Walmart and buy a new one? I don't know. But someone for graduation gave me this little sewing kit. Thanks. And, and <laughs> I better use it. I'm not sure I did a good job, but, you know, I, in a sense, I, I did it. And there's some things where you just got to do it. But I'm just telling you, God wants to give you grace. You know, for, uh, for four years, for four years, I, I served um, with a, a pastor. that I, loved. I mean, I cut my teeth underneath him. I mean, this, this guy put up, uh, in the church, put up with hopefully the worst of me. I mean, I, I, my te- I, he let me preach quite often. I developed. But can I tell you, after just a short time of Megan and I being there, I knew, I mean, I saw the potential in that church. I saw the potential in that community. And here I'm just this, you know, this 21, 22-year-old uh, young guy just out of Bible college, ready to take on the world. And I thought I had all the answers. Really, I, I understand now I didn't. Um, but but as, I, as I saw the potential, can I tell you, it didn't take long at all for me to be on that staff that I, I, I struggled because I was like, yeah, but if we did this, and I started dreaming about how could we do this, but I knew I wasn't the visionary. I had to fall underneath his vision. And so throughout those four years, there were conversations like, hey, but what do you think about this? Hey, what do you think about this? Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And nothing ever really happened. And can I tell you, after a year or two, both Megan and I were kind of at that point of, oh, man, there's just so much more. And they even ended up moving us into another position. And I felt like that's going to be the answer because then we could, we could well, now we're the associate pastors and now maybe have a little more. But still, we're underneath his vision. And, and this is what I'm saying to you. I'm not bragging on myself at all, but I'm saying God gave me the grace and gave us the grace to stay, and I'm so glad he did because through all of those four years, I was, I was frustrated after a year and a half, two years. Just Man, I felt like there's so much more we could accomplish, we could do, but God gave me the grace to stay, and it was the right thing you see for us to run from that at that moment would have been it would have been unwise you see because God's saying I've got you here for a reason and you may feel like you're chained but I'm just telling you these I want to teach you something through this and I could share all kinds of things that we learned because we stayed and I just felt like as I conclude this message there's some of you keep running you're running. You're running too early. I'm not saying there's never a time to, to change or this, but you're running from jobs, running from relationships, running from people. When God's trying to teach you to trust him for the grace to just get through it. Are you following me here? You get what I'm saying? Some of you, you're looking for God. You're praying, oh God, get me out of this. Oh God, get me out of this. Oh God, get me out. But you're missing the point of this. But oh God, whatever you're trying to teach me, teach me. God, as I go through this, whatever you're trying to do in me, do it in me. God, give me the grace to live through this. The Apostle Paul said, I have that grace to share the gospel with you guys. And my, my prayer is that, that you walk and live in his grace no matter what situation you find yourself in. And say, God, it doesn't matter how dire, or, I know that you can use me in this situation. Are you with me? Come on, would you stand with me all over this house? Let's pray.